Welcome to the Lore Tours of Intergalactic Aerospace Expo 2951. This is where I walk the floor of IAE and tell you all about the history of the ships on display and their creators. Now join me on the floor for your tour. Welcome to Crusader Day here on the floor. We're going to be talking about Crusader and Tumbral land systems, who they are, what ships they create, why they create them, and where they come from in the first place. So let's start off, as always, with a little bit of backstory. Crusader Industries was founded pretty recently, actually. Let me look at the actual date. 2799 by, by, by a man by the name of August, August Dunlow. Um, he was a native of Crocia uh, in Angeli. And he, when, when he was a kid, his family was fairly well-to-do, about middle class. He went to a boarding school. He, was, he had a pretty all right life, even in the middle of the, if it was towards the end of the Messer era. And um, a, during, the, during the coup that would overthrow the second to last Messer, when the, the last Messer, uh, Linton, overthrew his father and killed him, um, it created a lot of havoc and chaos on, in Angeli. Uh, specifically while he was watching, while Hulk Dunlow was watching. Uh, his mother was killed in the crossfire and his father was gravely injured. Uh, so August had to go start working to try to pay for medical bills. And in the process, his father died, meaning you know, he was an orphan in the streets of Angeli. He was luckily picked up by an orphanage and was allowed to go to school and used his own um, hatred <laughs> for the Messers as kind of a... Um, a burning passion and eventually managed to uh, go to uh, college, get a, get a degree in business, uh, business administration, uh, was fairly successful. And uh, right out of college, he became a uh, an activist, um, an anti measure activist, a protester. And he was very good, very charismatic, very good at organizing people and getting them pointed in the right direction um, to the point where the measures tried to assassinate him and failed because he was sick. So he missed a transport that he was supposed to be on going to Terra to a protest. So after this, um, many in the, the resistance, um, the measure resistance smuggled him out into Xi'an space where he would stay there until the fall of the Meza regime, which he was then smuggled back in during the, during the collapse of the Meza regime to help, help bring down the fascist government. Um, so he then sincerely thought that he could change for the better. He could change um, the government and make the government everything he wanted to happen and found out that the government moves way too slow for his liking. Um, so he took some of his business experience and found a struggling shuttle manufacturer called Seraphim Systems and convinced the owner to help him to have he he essentially helped buy her out um, and convinced her to change the name from Seraphim Systems to Crusader. Um, the, the owner was very religious and um, so it, was, it took a lot of negotiation um, and he eventually she eventually agreed that calling Crusader would be a good uh, compromise. Uh, and since Crusader Industries um, had, was mostly a shuttle manufacturer at first, they had some problems because they were reliant on other large shipping manufacturers to get their stuff to market. This is in the middle of probably the worst shipping crisis in U uh, UEE history, when many companies had been, who had made um, large uh, transport ships in the past, had uh, just disappeared. So there just wasn't enough ships and maintenance of ships uh, you know, like parts floating around to continue the the uh, the demands of the UEE. Uh, this is where uh, several companies, including um, uh, Misk, uh, Drake, and even Origin, first got their start making transport ships uh, to fill the vacancies that the end of the measure uh, left behind with all these older companies who had too close ties with the measures collapsing, um, you know, they needed someone to fill the role. So uh, Crusader first started getting their, uh, uh, you know, decided that they were going to, well, in a conversation with one of his foremen, um, the foreman basically said, I can, could guarantee you that if we could, if we, if we had a ship that we could deliver um, our shuttles, we would be there on time. We'd have no problems. And so... Dunlow was just like, why don't we build one? Which became the uh, Crusader Jupiter, which was designed specifically to carry shuttles. 
And from there began the tradition of Crusader building larger and larger ships. Uh, after the Jupiter, they built a, a Starliner, a luxury transport ship. Um, and then they started making the Hercules and then the Genesis and then the Star, the, the, the Mercury um, and so on and so forth. So we'll talk a little bit about those ships there. But they started as this, you know, just sh shuttle manufacturing and then eventually kind of broken off into to transport for people and transport for goods. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about Tumbrel before we get started. So Tumbrel was founded in 2536 by uh, a couple uh, who were raised on the mo on the planet of Yar in the Centauri system. Both of them were originally from Saisei in... Um, uh, I'm blanking on the name. I think it's Saisei is just the, 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 the planet. Yeah, Centauri 3, so Saisei. Uh, in Fujin City. They are both from Fujin City originally, but um, the uh, husband was uh, a son of the... of a... professor at, at Fujin City and the university in Fujin City. And the wife, who was the daughter of two uh, kind of blue-collar workers who were working on a research base owned by the university... And um, through their, you know, her, her um, the wife's parents had taken an old ground vehicle and tuned it up and made sure it could run uh, in the in the harsh desert sands of Yar. And if it wasn't for her parents t tinkering with this, 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 you know, uh, ground vehicle, uh, then the uh, mother of the uh, the husband would have died. So um, with. Her and her husband, when the when the, the the girl helped save the boy's the boy's mother, they became very close and eventually got married uh, after going to college and uh, him getting a, a degree in business and her getting a degree in engineering. But they found themselves, you know, mostly okay living in Fujin City and they had a pretty good life, but they were bored. <laughs> they just didn't like it, and they so they decided that they were going to take a gamble and took a job working at the old station that they met at first. And they used that time to build prototypes for ground vehicles because they found that they both really wanted to recapture that experience. And um, they called it Tumbrel because of uh, they took apart an old uh, cart that was like an old trailer that, they, that was used um, on the site uh, to build their first prototypes. And the first prototype they created was called the DX... Um, the actual name of it. The DX-20. It was very fast. It was fun. It was. It could go around uh, anywhere. It was very all-terrain. Uh, but in a time period when you have spaceships, who needs cars? So it didn't sell very well. It did well. It reviewed well. Uh, but then you had the outbreak of the First Tavaran War. As I say, in, and the Centauri system are on the very front lines of this conflict. And the UEE realized quite quickly that they needed some sort of ground transportation uh something that was low signature that could get troops safely across the battlefield in all, tr all conditions, uh, and they didn't have one. So they pulled every kind of current manufacturer who builds anything like a ground vehicle together, and the DX-20 was one of them, and it blew the absolute lid off of the competition. It, there's no, there was no even, not even closer to the DX-20. And to top that off, all the DX-20 needed was a little bit of armor and a gun. And it was pretty much ready to go, ready for the battlefield. So it wasn't that much of a modification. So the UPE purchased um, uh, the, uh, I think it was the UNE. I don't know why it was UPE. I don't think the first round was UPE. But um, it might have been. The, yeah, it was, it was UPE. You know, my bad. Yeah, the UPE army purchased tons of these. And they became like the symbol of the first of Aran War. Um, they were their armored personnel carriers. They carried troops to the battle, and the troops who, who rode on them trusted their lives in them. And after the battle, or after the war was over, they when they went back to civilian life, they bought DX twenties because they just loved them so much. And Tumbrel began to expand, just explode from there, and started to build more and more different types of ground vehicles. Unfortunately, over time, they lost their luster as. They started losing government contracts, and some of their products weren't quite as popular as they hoped that it would be. And by uh, 2862, uh, they had to fold. Uh, but recently, 
uh, a group of uh, men by the name of Terence Naban, uh, who was uh, the leader of a company called a, a joint, joint Financial Venture um, by the Devco Group. Uh, he was the kind of leader of the Devco Group. Bought the rights to the IPs uh, of Tumbrel and the name Tumbrel and then revamped it because he was a huge Tumbrel fan. He had a bunch of old like DX20s and, and other, sh uh, other vehicles like the like Tim, uh, Timora and the C-Series, uh, which we may see in the game, hopefully. <laughs> Seriously, CIG, DX20, come on. Uh, but these, uh, he, he was a big fan of them, so he wanted to bring back uh, Tumbrel. And so far, he's been very successful. So let's get started with the ships and the vehicles that made these companies so popular. Let's start with the, the, what is it, the C2? I'm just find the M2. This might be M2. I don't know what it is. The Hercules Starlifter. M2, yeah, it's the M2. Okay, yeah, it's just hard to sell. So the M2 is important because it is the first star lifter. As I said, middle, um, early, uh, early 29th century, the Mesor era is, is folded, but there's this major problem with uh, transportation. And the UEE military also realized had realized for several years, but it kind of, because of the fall of measures, it kind of got put off, that they were lacking heavy lift vehicles. A, a study in the 28th century had pointed out that the um, the casualty rates were much higher in any kind of ground uh, operation um, because of the lack, the, the inability to drop, say, Nova tanks directly onto the battlefield or heavy armored vehicles that could help, or support craft that could help support um, troops, uh, infantry on the battlefield. And because of that, they needed a ship that could go pretty much on the front lines, drop almost on the front lines, and carry heavy amounts of cargo and support vehicles and troops. So this, they created a company called, or a division called Starlift Command, and uh, asked for bids for uh, a new heavy lift transport ship. And a bunch of companies you think of would enter, uh, but surprisingly, Crusader entered. Now, Crusader at this point had only been known for their shuttles, for the Jupiter, and for a, um, a type of uh, early Starliner, uh, a luxury kind of people transport. So the, <laughs> the UAE was a little confused. They, they didn't see this company as being really one for military purposes or even transport, really. They had done heavy transport, but nothing like, like they needed. Um, but when they looked at the designs, the Starfarer just stood out, or Starfarer, the, Star, the, the, uh, the Hercules stood out uh, and heads and shoulders above its competition. It was tough, it was durable, it was easy to fix, and it held a ton of cargo, cargo and it could carry up to three Nova tanks plus their crews and infantry and even still have some space for uh, material for, for, for ammo and medical supplies and whatever. So, and it didn't require a ton of uh, crew to, to, to operate, only three or four. So it was chosen as uh, the M2. It became the, the, the Hercules M2 Starlifter it was its, its official military de designation. And it is still in use today. Uh, it was first deployed by the UEE Marines during a strike operation against a uh, pirate base that was in an asteroid, uh, or I use an asteroid or a small moon. But it was a, kind of a border world from the UEE. Uh, this, this pirate base had been causing a lot of problems, so the Marines loaded up some uh, a tank division, um, well, maybe not division, but tanks, into um, some, and troops into Starlifters, escorted by uh, vanguards into, uh, quietly into the system, uh, and they landed their, uh, their M2s just outside of the, the, the base and began the assault, and the result was zero casualties. Uh, maybe at least by the, the Marines, possibly lots of casualties from the pirates. But the pirates were so surprised that they, they didn't know what would hit them because, you know, they weren't expecting tanks just to be there. <laughs> and um, as a result, the M2 was, was, was a, a huge success. 
uh, by just how much firepower it could bring to a battlefield very quickly and somewhat quietly uh, and still survive a lot of you know direct shots. <clears throat> now, after the M2, we have the A2 and the C2. These were built fairly recently. <clears throat> the current CEO of Crusader, uh, Kelly Kaplan, who we'll talk about a little bit more, who was behind the Genesis Starliner program, and her team created what was called the Roll and Go system, which allowed them to build vehicles, um, big vehicles, modularly with like more modularity, quicker and on the same assembly lines as the kind of more vanilla ships. So they had been selling, uh, they'd been wanting to sell the M2 to civilians for a while. And when they finally did, were able to release the M2 to civilians, they also released the C2 and the A2, which were variants built with the same roll and go technology. So the C2 has sacrifices a little bit more of its armor, but has more cargo space. Um, and doesn't, it doesn't have the kind of crew quarters that it needs to for like tanks and such. And the A2 has pretty much everything that the M2 has, but it sacrifices a little bit more of its space, usable space interiorly for bombs and lots of guns. So. Uh, now let's talk about the Nova. So we talked about the DX-20, which was the, the kind of poster child of the First Tavarian War. Well, after uh, the First Tavarian War, or during the Second Tavarian War, they needed something with a little bit more kick, a li little less transport capability, because DX-20 was still kicking around, so it was still not a bad option. But they needed something that could also punch out. And um, so they went back to um, their old designs. There is some theory, there were some uh, mentions that a tank existed during the first of Iron War built by the Nova, by the by Tumbrel, that was not the Nova, uh, but the Nova was the new and improved tank design by Tumbrel um, for the Second of Iron War. And Novas were very, very good at their jobs. Um, there is um, a famous Battle of Korean Pass, uh, Korean Pass, I think it was, where. Uh, Three Novas held off an entire Tavaran army alone, just with their, with their three Novas for an entire day. Um, they're, they're tough, you know, even in game today, this gun right here uh, is second only to the Idris railgun. I'm not even kidding. This is, this is the most powerful gun, one of the most powerful guns in the game. Uh, so it, it, it can take a lot of hits and it can deal out a ton of firepower. These things are effectively ships with tracks on them instead of engines. And they still have lower signatures than most ships do, too. So they're not as fast as ships, obviously, but they still offer a lot of protection and a lot of firepower for ground troops, a lot of ground support. Um, and though the Tumbrel Nova, the Nova had been kind of um, phased out because of the end of uh, Tumbrel's existence, the uh, it was brought back when the new owner for Tumbrel came back, uh, a, a specifically as a um, asset to fight against the the, uh, the Vanduul. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the Tumbrel Novas are now not only available for the military, but available for you yourself if you want to fight against uh, against uh, outlaws or aliens in the deep frontier. With that, let's talk about uh, the the other ships from Crusader: the Starliner and the Starfighter, or Starliner, the Star Runner and the Starfighter. All right, here we go. The other ships from Crusader. We'll start with the uh, Starfighter. Now, the Starfighter, the Ares, is actually a joint weapons program. It's not really Crusader Industries, but uh, Bering, the company who makes the weapons on the, the, the ships, which was reaching out for companies to help them essentially have a ship to build around their guns, these new experimental guns. And Crusader stepped forward and offered to help and won the contract, and they've been working, they worked together to build this. Um, the goal of the Ares program was to, well, it was the Bering S7 program. I can't remember the name, the, um, I think it was, I think like the S7, look at the actual gun that it has on top of it. Uh, the SF7, yes, the SF7. The SF-7 uh, program was to uh, essentially give some capital class killing firepower to a, to a fighter. Um, as what's been happening recently in the UAE is the military is trying to move away from big fleets or big squadrons and miniaturizing fleets or squadrons into smaller ships. So a handful of ships can do the same thing that a big fleet or a, a large squadron could do before um, so that they could diversify the you know 
spread out their their numbers a little bit more during the the, the height of this Vanduul conflict, which is pulling so much resources to the front line. So this is designed to help kill larger capital ships, which are finding their way into outlaw hands, people like Xenothreat. So this is essentially designed to counter Xenothreat, uh, especially um, designed possibly in Lord, designed after the invasion of uh, Stanton, the first invasion of Stanton by Xenothreat, <clears throat> as almost a response to that. Um, but we'll see. And there's also a ground, this is a ground target one versus that's the Ion and this is the Inferno. And the Inferno is the same ship with a slightly different variant, a ballistic variant of the, of the size seven bearing, which is um, designed for ground strafing attacks. Uh, so capital ships, they can both fight capital ships, but this one is designed for more, you know, essentially a cannon versus a rotary cannon. Now we've got the Star Runner. The Star Runner was built, we don't know exactly, but it's most likely built in the late 29th, early 30th centuries. Um, it is a data runner. Uh, one of the big things that has come up in the re recent <coughs> history of the UEE is uh, that data running has become more and more of a viable profession as uh, the economy is expanding. It's just exploding uh, all over the uh UEE space. There are more places that are getting more resources than they've ever had before, uh, much more open trade being being offered, and as a result, there's a lot of information that's being flown back and forth, which is not as safe if it's on unsecured open channels from relay to relay. Uh, the way that information works in Star Citizen Universe is there's no faster than light communication, so you have to send something through a jump point, and then it has to kind of pony express its way to um, from relay point to relay point, uh, through automated beacons uh, to its location. So if you're sending like financial information or critical uh, information about a location or top secret or confidential uh, information, sending it over open channels like that just is going to make it get caught. And there's also uh, some slowdown because the message has to be transmitted at the speed of light, go to point to point, and then when it reaches a, a jump point, it has to um, de-download it into a probe. The probe then has to be um, you know, removed from the station and then shot through it through a jump point and then has to go through the jump point successfully get to the other side, redock with the station or transmit its, its information to that to the next station and then redock. Uh, and that process itself can take a little bit of time um, to be to be, you know, sorted and then passed around. So the um, uh, info runners, uh, people who, who basically take this data, stick, stick it into a secure server rack on their ships and then just go uh, are often faster and much more secure than the uh, than, than over open comms. So the Mercury is a info runner, but it also has a little bit more than that. It also has cargo capacity and it also has some sneaky little shielded holes down below. Um, <clears throat> let me look at the read the, uh, the Whitley's guide for a speed demons annual. <clears throat> the Mercury is one of the most agile data runners on the market, consistently scoring within the top five fastest combined use transport ships available today. The Mercury is good because uh, it's, it's, its strength is its speed and its fuel. The Mercury can fit the fastest quantum drives available to its size and still basically sip quantum. It just has so much quantum fuel that it just can go for days, which makes it very, very good for long range transport. Obviously, info running is its main main role, but it does have a large cargo bay, so it can also be used as a cargo bay. It gives a nice little flexibility for info runners, so that if they want to run data, they can also run cargo on the side. Um, and they don't; it doesn't have great guns on it, but it does have enough for for decent defensive capabilities. Um, I wouldn't put it up against, say, like a Connie, but it's not bad for its agility, its speed, and its uh, fuel consumption. It's very good info running ship. Uh, also, probably the most infamous um, of these is the Belligerent Duck by Alex Dugan and Maz Hulan, uh, who we've seen the reunion. If you see the reunion video that CIG did for the launch of this uh, this ship, uh, they they are the probably most infamous. The, the Belligerent Duck is the most infamous star runner, and Alex um, Dugan is and and Maz her. Copilot are probably some of the most infamous smugglers and criminals in the UEE for some reasonable and unreasonable reasons, but yeah, they're very good at using this ship to get in and out of, out of tough situations. With that, let's go talk a little bit more about 
tumbrel ships. All right, here we go. The Cyclone series of vehicles. Um, these are brand new. They're not like the Tumbrel, which was, or the Nova, which was once a, a Tumbrel vehicle before the collapse of, of Tumbrel, the, 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 the closing of the old Tumbrel. This is brand new. These were built <clears throat> possibly, my, my theory is possibly based off of the C series chassis, uh, but new in that they, the Cyclones were built after the relaunch and they're built with the same kind of love and attention, the same kind of, uh, thing, the, the stuff that made Tumbrel so beloved to so many for so long. They're, they're rugged, they're tough, they can go pretty much anywhere, They and they have um, v many variants here to kind of do what they need to. It's a toolbox, so whatever you need, uh, whatever kind of cyclone you need, you can find one. Uh, this is probably the most useful in game right now, this is the MT. The MT is um, got a nice thick, thick cannon, plus some pretty heavy rockets. Um, and uh, it does require two people to operate, but you also have three seats, so it's a nice little kind of combat ship, uh, or vehicle. Then you've got the, the AA variant, which is an anti-aircraft. I think it also has a, um, a EMP on it, but it also has some anti-aircraft missiles, which aren't quite as big as the, the MT's missiles, but they, you know, the, the, the EMP works pretty well as well. And this is the TR, which is just a, you know, has a, Gat, a ballistic Gatling variant on the back, gun on the back for, um, for usage. And I think it's got some weapon storage here on the side. Yeah, those are weapons. You can put some weapons in there. I don't think the MT has that, does it? Oh, it does. It does have, it does have those. Um, do all of them have them? Yeah, they all have them. So, yeah, these were all variants built after the, the founding. This is actually the, the first initial launch. When, when Tumbrel first launched, they launched the Cyclone as their start. Ooh, that was the fastest. I don't know what that happened there. All right. Then we've got the, the base Cyclone variant, which is the base that came out. The RC, which is a racing variant used uh, extensively in the Daymar Rally, now officially canon. Uh, and of course the M the RN. So this is a recon variant. Uh, supposedly it could drop like probes. It has a high, a more advanced scanner. So this is kind of like an explorer's ver version of the cyclone. So yeah, they've, they've done fairly well. And because of the success of the cyclone and the Nova, we'll talk a little bit about the Ranger here in a moment um, within the concept because it's not quite out yet, but it's uh, it is the direct result of the cyclone program. So here's the Ranger. This might be actually one to one. It's probably a little bigger compared to what it actually is, but uh, the Ranger is um, uses the same uh, technology developed from the Cyclone program as a motorcycle. It, it allows you to get to places easily from place to place, and uh, yeah, it's a motorcycle. There's there's a couple different variants. There's the um, look at the, the ones. There's the CV, the RC, and the TR. The CV allows for a little bit of a cargo capacity. There's a little bit of a back area here for cargo in the back. Um, then there's the the RC, which is just a racing variant, pure racing. And lastly, you have the TR, which is uh, got some guns to it for, for more of a, uh, of a combat variant. Um, this, I think, is the TR, based off those guns. This must be the TR. But the, the advantage of the um, Cyclone compared to other vehicles is that it folds up very, very well, and it has much lower signature than even hover bikes. So you could fit a Cyclone theoretically inside of a, a, a I think, a, a MPVU cargo variant. So the Argo Cargo can carry one, if not a few of these. Um, the Titan, the Avenger Titan, can definitely carry one of these. So if you need something that can get you into a place more uh, stealthily and you don't have a lot of space, say you just have a Titan, a Ranger is a perfect um, companion for the Titan because you can then deploy it out and, and uh, you know, pull it out of your, your, your cargo bay, then deploy it and head off into, into the sunset. So and it's also, it's a motorbike. It's a motorbike. It's an Akira motorbike. It's Star Citizen. Who doesn't like that stuff? <laughs> All right. Lastly, we're going to talk about the uh, the first ship that CIG sold of the Starliner uh, of the of Crusader, but one that is probably going to get a little bit of a rework is the Genesis. Now, the Genesis program was created to replace its aging Starliner um, 
series from before. I can't remember the exact name of it. But the Genesis was top of the line. Uh, it was developed using many different new techniques, like the Roll and Go system, which allowed for the Genesis to be built, um, individual Genesis to be made custom order on the same assembly lines as just generic ones because of just how they've tooled out their, their, their machines. Um, so it, it, the, the Genesis has become so popular, it has become the 707 or the 747 of the Star Citizen universe. It is pretty much every transport, you know, uh, civilian transport company that transports, you know, people <laughs> um, is going to use a Genesis. At least have a, a, a couple of Genesis in their, in their fleet. They're ubiquitous with people moving. In fact, they're so ubiquitous with, with, with uh, travel uh, especially for like vacation travel, that some people use the term I'm going on crusade when they mean they're going, it's like a, like a popular term for saying I'm going on vacation or going on holiday, they say I'm going on crusade because the likelihood of you going on a crusader uh, Genesis Starliner is pretty high if you're going to be leaving one system to another on a vacation. So, uh, but because of the technology developed by Genesis, because of the Genesis specifically, it allowed for the creation of the M2 and the A, or the C2 and the A2 uh, as well as other systems um, as well. Now, the real story behind the Genesis is that Kelly Kaplan, who is the lead of the Genesis program, uh, impressed Dunlow so much that when he retired, he promoted her to CEO. And Kaplan was the one who actually bought Crusader, the gas giant and the Stanton system, because of her ideas for improving production quality uh, overall. So she's kind of carried on the legacy of Dunlow pretty well. We, I don't know if Dunlow's still alive. He could very well be still alive, though he would be very, very old, probably 200-something years old, which would be a little weird for humans at this time in, in the Star Citizen universe. Not impossible, but weird. Uh... <clears throat> But she's also kind of gotten herself in a little bit of hot water because um, her security, her last security, head of security, really didn't pay attention to crime in, in the Crusader system, the Crusader planetary system. And under that, that, that under her watch, Jumptown happened. So uh, she'd gotten into a little bit of, um, the Jumptown Wars kind of got her into a little bit of hot water with the UEE. So they had to replace their security guard, their, their security, head of security, and then they, um, have been building a lot more, some more combat ships and doing a little bit more things to appease the UEE as a result. So that is the Crusader. Uh, that is Crusader. That is uh, the Genesis. That is uh, Crusader and Tumble Day here on the floor. If you enjoy this, please hit that like button if you haven't already done so. Um, think about subscribing as well. It helps a lot. Hit subscribe button, hit the little bell icon, and then make sure you click all notifications because otherwise YouTube doesn't think that you want this for some reason. So make sure you do that to keep up to date. Comment down below, Do you like, wh which of these ships are your favorite? Do you like all of them? Is there one specific one? Do you think the Cyclone is even worth it these days? Do you think it'll, it'll shine here when we, get, we start getting Pyro and such? Uh, are you excited for the Cyclone, for the, uh, the, the Ranger and the, uh, the Genesis, like I am? <laughs> Stupidly excited? Uh, let me know your, th your thoughts down below. Uh, and as always, remember, Exastoria at Astra. <laughs>